Hello, welcome to GeoBytes, your daily roundup of news from geospatial industry. I'm your host, Bhanu Reka. For the next 15 minutes, I will bring you the news from the top developments across projects, products, policies, and businesses. But first, let's look at what's making headlines today. Uber has grabbed a chunk of Microsoft Bing's mapping technology and around 100 of its data collection engineers. The ride-hailing company uses a combination of map services from Google, Apple, and China's Baidu and will continue to do so. But what's interesting is that the company has been trying to get its hands on mapping technology for quite some time now. First, there were rumors that Uber was bidding for Nokia's here mapping business. Then, earlier this month, Uber poached the former head of Google Maps, Brian McClendon, to head its new advanced technology center. Uber is working with Carnegie Mellon University to develop self-driving cars. The present move makes it obvious that Uber wants to stop relying on service partners. The Silicon Valley engineers who Uber would be absorbing as part of the deal are the same folks who worked to get the image data into Bing. The company would be acquiring a data center outside of Boulder, Colorado, as well as cameras, software, and a license to Microsoft intellectual property. Though the companies did not disclose the financial terms of the agreement, Microsoft released a statement which read, over the past year, we have taken many actions to focus the company's efforts around our core business strategy. In keeping with these efforts, we will no longer collect mapping imagery ourselves and instead will continue to partner with premium content and imagery providers for underlying data while concentrating our resources on the core user experience. With this decision, we will transfer many of our imagery acquisition operations to Uber. Meanwhile, Uber tried to play down the whole thing. It said that since mapping is at the heart of what makes Uber great, it will continue to work with partners as well as invest in its own technology to build the best possible experience for riders and drivers. Social media went into a tizzy as the news broke. Tech blogger Robert Scoble said on Facebook that take no dependencies on other companies' APIs is the new mantra in tech industry. On Twitter, Boris Anthony, a former experienced architecture at, archi architect at Nokia here said, Weird, how does Microsoft think it can do situation awareness and context relevance without Bing? Moving on. NASA reports that an international Earth-observing mis mission studying the salinity of the ocean surface ended earlier this month. The mission, called Aquarius, was an international collaboration between NASA and Argentina's space agency. It was launched in 2011. It was the first mission to combine use of passive radiometer and active radar measurements at L-band. It demonstrated that accurate, scientifically significant measurements of salinity could be made from space. It should also be noted that salinity information is critical for understanding the Earth's water cycle and ocean circulation. Data from Aquarius reveal how extreme floods impact our seas and how low salinity river plumes affect hurricane intensity. In another development, online mapping project AIDSVU has released its annual interactive map depicting the latest data for HIV prevalence in the United States. The map couples geospatial mapping with epidemiological analysis to show the data for 34 most impacted U.S. cities, including year-by-year -year new diagnosis data for 2008 to 2013. These maps show the areas where new HIV cases continue to rise, illustrating the need for prevention, testing, and treatment resources. For instance, this year's maps reveal that new diagnoses are highest in urban areas. In the southern United States, even some rural counties have substantial rates of new HIV diagnosis. 
Now, for those, who, those, for those of you looking for a job change, here's a good news. Florida-based Faro Technologies is searching for a new senior vice president and chief financial officer. Faro's former CFO, Peter G. Abram, resigned from his position in March earlier this year. Additionally, Faro is hiring for various C-level and engineering profiles too. Ten positions are said to be open in total in the company. We are now going to slip into a short break, but when we return, we will take a look at the news from the, re from the other regions of the world. State media is reporting that the country has launched a high-resolution optical Earth observation satellite. The Gaofen 8 satellite lifted off from its Taiyuan Space Center in northern China last weekend. It is part of a civilian program which will help in land surveys, urban planning, road network planning, crop yield measurements and responding to natural disasters. The Space and Upper Atmosphere Research Commission of Pakistan has announced that all, all rivers of Punjab will now be monitored by satellites. Chief Relief Commissioner of Punjab, Nadeem Ashraf, reveals that a modern software has been developed to obtain information regarding the flow of water and its impact on surrounding areas. Information will also be received regarding rains through satellites so that planning could be done for relief work in future. Also from South Asia, reports are coming in that India's Defence Research and Development Organisation DRDO will be using Rustam-1 drone to monitor its maritime boundary with Sri Lanka. The organization is working with the country's naval force to fit the drone with an automatic identification system to identify Indian fishing vessels along the maritime boundary. If an Indian vessel strays into Sri Lankan waters or an unidentified boat enters Indian waters, a digital data link between the UAV and a ground control station on the Indian coast will alert the Navy and Coast Guard in real time. In another development from India, the country's Prime Minister launched the Smart Cities mission last week. The mission aims to create 100 smart cities through an $8 billion initiative over five years. 
The Indian government understands that geospatial technology plays a crucial role in improving quality of life of citizens, improving business infrastructure and reducing impact on the environment. It has mandated that cities would be expected to develop their smart city development plans based GIS mapping, spatial mapping, ICT mapping and master plan. The cities will also prepare a 3D GIS map of property and all services including power, water supply, sewerage. Moving on, the French government has announced that it will be using PTV Group's Optima Data Analytics software to provide real-time speed data analysis for the Great Paris region. 12 million people live in this area which constitutes 18% of French population and produces 30% of its national GDP. The government wants to ensure high level performance for the entire road network and to provide highly accurate user information. PTV Optima combines offline traffic modeling with real-time data and algorithms. It also covers the traffic condition for roads without spatial distribution and can predict the consequences of unexpected events. And now, we have got something for tennis fans. Britain's mapping agency Ordnance Survey has released the history of Wimbledon in maps. The agency reveals that it has been mapping Wimbledon for almost 100 years now. What you're seeing now is the map from 1896. The club was based at Warpel Road until 1922 and not at the existing Church Road site. This is the current 1 is to 25,000 scale color raster showing the developments of several decades. It should be noted that the new Wimbledon master plan packs in huge redevelopment including a retracting roof for number one coat and repositioning other coats. That's all we have for you in Geobytes today. Find us on www.geobiz.com and follow Geobiz on Twitter. We'll be back soon shortly with a Geobiz exclusive. Once again, Trimble is leading the way in positioning technology with the new Trimble R8S GNSS receiver. An entirely new way to look at receiver possibilities. Simply choose the configuration and features you require today. Then, add features as you need them tomorrow. It's the ultimate in scalability. With this innovative receiver, you tailor your system to your job, to the way you work. Choose the level of configuration that suits your needs. As your requirements change, the Trimble R8S can adapt. You simply add functionality whenever you want it. Each Trimble R8S comes standard with integrated Maxwell 6 chips, Trimble 360 tracking technology, and more. All to keep you productive and expand the reach of your GNSS system. Plus, it offers our exclusive web UI for remote monitoring and the new Trimble DL Android app for GNSS data logging. And the Trimble R8S maximizes productivity by easily integrating with the Trimble S-Series total stations and our innovative V10 imaging rover. For ultimate field efficiency, combine the Trimble R8S receiver with a Trimble controller and the intuitive Trimble access field software. Trust Trimble Business Center to help you edit, process, and adjust your data. It's the kind of solution you have come to expect from Trimble. We've been setting the standard in positioning technology for more than 30 years. See how we're raising the bar again with the Trimble R8S GNSS receiver. Can you tell us a little, a little bit about uh, GEO and what it is that you do in the organization? We have a lot of obviously formidable competitors in the mapping space. But saying Human Geo, I was like uh, perplexed why the name Human to the geospatial angle. If we think about land, I mean land is a key core to prosperity. Thank you Hugo for speaking with the Geobiz and Geospatial World.
Good morning, uh, Abe uh, uh, Asher. Uh, welcome to GeoBiz. Uh, we're happy, very happy to host you over here and understand more about Human Geo. But saying Human Geo, I was like uh, perplexed. Why the name Human to the geospatial angle? Human Geo is short for Human Geography, mm -hmm. and our company is a big data analytics company mm -hmm. that uses new computer science techniques mm -hmm. to understand macro human behavior for market research. How did it all start? So my own background, um, in the 2000s I worked as a cryptologist for an organization in the U.S. intelligence community mm -hmm. and then I left there to work at Google and Google Enterprise which is the organization that does Google Maps and Google Earth. Mm -hmm. um, in 2011 I linked up with a business partner to create a new company. We really felt like there was a demand uh, within the marketplace for advanced analytics for geospatial data mm -hmm. as there's a convergence of both public data and proprietary data and commercial information and open social media information. I see that uh, Human Geo's uh, USP is its uh, ability uh, to manage and uh, maneuver and manipulate uh, data. Can you tell more about your data and data solutions? When I was at Google, I learned um, there's a vision there for organizing the world's information and making it useful and relevant to users. Mm -hmm. For many years, I've had a passion about geospatial data and map data. So what Human Geo has tried to do is take principles that relate to how you organize big data and simplify it in tools that allow people to explore um, through a very simple interface public data that has some location association with it. Sometimes this is social media data, sometimes this is open data from governments, but we're trying to make it really easy for people to add location context mm -hmm. to their business intelligence. How do you actually integrate uh, very structured data which is geospatial and uh, add the attribute or un and unstructured data this, these days in coming in trillions and trillions of uh, uh, bytes? Well, this is very much an art and a science to combine geospatial data and business data, but what we found is frequently identifying a particular domain that people are familiar with mm -hmm. and aggregating the data in ways that make sense. So within the United States, mm -hmm. that might mean taking geospatial data and linking it uh, by a zip code or a state location mm -hmm. so that people can look at macro trends around a, a particular region mm -hmm. and then um, use those insights combined with their understanding of their corporate market mm -hmm. as it relates to different locations. Would you like to share an example, cite an example? Uh, one of Human Geo's customers is a multi-billion dollar video game company and they're very interested in the public perceptions of their product. So we have a turnkey application called Media Monitor mm -hmm. that accepts 10 different geolocated social media mm -hmm. uh, data feeds and then adds uh, sentiment scoring to the information and shows uh, instrumentation by state uh, within the United States of which regions feel positive about a game or a product that's come out from this company mm -hmm. and which regions feel negative and the software company uses those impressions to actually create tailored marketing mm -hmm. to each geospatial region of the United States mm -hmm. based on the perceptions of their customers there. I see that you're using a, a variety of uh, data technologies. Uh, so how will these technologies pan out when you have to integrate and anal analyze process and analyze uh, geospatial data? With the convergence of uh, mobile phones and social media, mm -hmm. There's an increasing amount of data being generated by the public all the time. So this is very exciting because there's an opportunity to understand in a really fundamental way what the public thinks, but it adds a lot of complexity because all of these different data have different assumptions. So um, what Human Geo has been doing is focusing on large social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter mm -hmm. and creating tools that make it simple to integrate those data with sort of more enterprise systems like Oracle Database, and Microsoft SQL Server Database and create application programmer interfaces. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we create the integration of the data for customers, other times customers just tap into the data that we have mm -hmm. to add it to their own systems. So you're more focused only on the data so the data part and the data solution of it and not with the entire workflow of a business enterprise? Correct. I think 
um, all computer scientists and engineers have to understand that most large organizations have many legacy capabilities mm -hmm. and it's too expensive for them to replace all of their legacy capabilities mm -hmm. for new ones. So the smartest and most cost efficient thing for organizations is to integrate new forms of data with the legacy systems that they already have. Well, I see data analytics as a huge opportunity in this, uh, uh, in this, at this point in time in the world, and much, much more beyond uh, geospatial. So, how is uh, Human Geo capturing uh, this market? Uh, are you focused only on the geospatial element? Originally, Human Geo was founded to be a big data analytics company focused on geospatial data. Mm -hmm. What we found is many of the algorithms and approaches we've developed can actually apply to other forms of big data analysis. So over the past several years, we've been branching out and uh, exploring new ways that we can capture unstructured and semi-structured data mm -hmm. and then enrich it with sentiment and implied location information mm -hmm. to make it more relevant and more easy to integrate for large enterprises. For example, what are the other areas you are looking at? Right now I think um, there is an entire cottage industry examining how we can take the observations mm -hmm. of people with mobile phones that are making uh, textual assertions. So like I like Coca-Cola, or I don't like Pepsi. Mm -hmm. um, how can we apply computer science and machine learning to capture text, which is a very imprecise thing, and human language, and then quantify it so we can apply methods of empiricism to examine sentiment and themes as they emerge over time. So uh, this is really a rich area for human geo, and we see a lot of innovation and a lot of possibility mm -hmm. for chief marketing officers as well as public affairs officials mm -hmm. in understanding uh, public perception mm -hmm. and public opinion. You're already serving uh, several other uh, markets as well, apart from the geospatial. So how do you, uh, how do you, see how big do you see, or how small you see geospatial market is vis-a-vis -vis other uh, segments? I think the geospatial market in North America is quite large. It's in the billions of dollars. And um, in the past, we've seen principally, you know, this was local, state, and national government organizations that had an appetite for geospatial data and geospatial analysis. That is changing. I think uh, there's a major turning point around 2007 when Apple released the iPhone and 2009 as the Android Google phones became common. Uh, consumers became very comfortable with the idea of using geospatial data themselves mm -hmm. and even producing geospatial data themselves. Mm -hmm. and so we see a lot of future growth in the geospatial market, not just in the government sector, but for consumers and commercial industry as well. But Human Geo is also into several services. Uh, would you like to share more on that? Human Geo is what I would describe as a full spectrum big data analysis company and we have core competency in using the Hadoop platform mm -hmm. which is a industry proven open source platform uh, for creating systems for data collection, data storage and data analysis. So while we do operate a lot in the geospatial market, uh, we also provide advanced analytics for uh, commercial companies mm -hmm. as well as uh, U.S. Department of Defense organizations. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, due to the sensitivity of U.S. government activities, I can't comment very specifically on the things we do with the Department of Defense. Where do you get the data from? You're also producing the data or you just aggregate and uh, get data from other partners? In general, Human Geo is not a data producer by itself. Mm -hmm but we consume data from a number of commercial and open sources. Um, for people interested in data innovation, I would certainly recommend data.gov, which is a site of the U.S. government, where there's thousands of data sets that have been put into the public domain uh, for the public good. In addition to that, the internet company Twitter mm -hmm. purchased a firm called Gnip, which is a major commercial data reseller mm -hmm. of dozens of social media channels, including Twitter, but not limited to that. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say the two major sources Human Geo uses are commercially licensed data from GNIP and open data from data.gov.
But when you talk about uh, uh, an enterprise solution, uh, how relevant are these uh, uh, open data uh, data and uh, the data you're collecting from GINEP relevant? I think there is always a need that is uh, required for that specific customer and for that pr particular enterprise. So uh, other, do you have any mechanisms with which uh, you outsource or you kind of produce uh, data? Human Geo does produce data as a, a synthesized element that is produced by analysis of raw data. So we do produce a lot of content about uh, customer sentiment mm -hmm. and macro trends that we see by analyzing data. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we do have capability to go out and collect internet-based data that is not commercially licensed from GNIP. Um, I think there is a useful metaphor when you think about uh, the full spectrum of value around big data. And in the past, I frequently talk about the way that people create insights with data is much like value creation in a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And the outputs of a kitchen are a product of the chefs, the utensils they have to work with, and the ingredients. So in a similar vein, the analytic outputs of big data analysis are a product of the engineers and scientists working with the data, the actual raw data they have to work with, and the applications and tools they apply to the data. So Human Geo has a number of data scientists and computer scientists internally. Uh, we use open platforms like Hadoop and some proprietary capabilities that we produce, like the Media Monitor, which I described earlier. Um, in conjunction with open data and licensed data to produce new insights so that Fortune 500s can better serve their customer markets and so the government can better understand sentiments in public opinion. As far as I understand, the traditional and the conventional geospatial market is very different and very distinct from the location-enabled or the uh, data-enabled uh, um, market. But I see that Human Geo is striking a very good balance and uh, 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 synchronization between these two. How are you guys uh, achieving? Human Geo is really fortunate. We're based in Arlington, Virginia, near Washington, D.C. So we have a great understanding of the requirements of the federal government mm -hmm. as it relates to their precise use of geospatial data for defense purposes and for um, the way that they need to serve U.S. citizens. At the same time, we have uh, a number of alumni from Google in our company and innovative computer scientists, and we're constantly on the lookout for how mobile computing technology like cell phones and iPads um, produce opportunities to serve consumers through location data. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a portfolio of activities going on, some of which are aimed at serving commercial interests and some are aimed at serving the government. And it's really an exciting time in Arlington, Virginia, where concurrently there's lots of opportunity in commercial industry and uh, to serve the U.S. government as well. I see that all your products have a, a spatial component to them. So uh, do you see going forward uh, spatial becoming too ubiquitous and uh, an integral part of every solution, every ID solution? I think there is certainly a trend where geospatial technology is underlying most new information technology. Um, this has been going on for a number of years and it's so common I think people don't even realize it. But a really simple example that's not proprietary, when you do a search on the internet on Google or Bing or Facebook, the search results that come back to you are tailored based on your location. So frequently, just the fact that your cell phone is located at a particular place is enough for the large internet companies to tailor the information they give you, the language that the search results are provided in, and even the recommendations that are given to you. Um, there's a, a really popular restaurant review site, Yelp.com, that uses your location to customize restaurants that it recommends to you, because certainly when you're going out to eat, you're interested in places near you, not places that are far away. Um, it certainly relates more than just food and search advertising. 
but I think uh, sort of as an invisible element of IT infrastructure, the location of consumers when they're interacting with systems is critical. And we're only going to see an increase in the amount of tailored information based on location in the future. But I see it's uh, the location, the combination of location and search is extremely potential, extremely potent, and uh, it's much, much more beyond just a simply an analysis of these two, and it's getting pretty intuitive, uh, and uh, um, it's almost like predicting uh, your mind and your future kind of a thing. So where are we uh, actually going uh, in terms of this technology evolution? Well, I think, um one really exciting thing about spatial technology is there are so many positive uses of it. Um, we're starting to see this a little bit with technologies that the big internet companies call recommendation engines. Mm -hmm. So with Microsoft, there's a capability call called Cortana. Mm -hmm. Amazon has a capability called Alexa. Google has a capability called Google Now. And all of these technologies use our location to create anticipatory intelligence that recommends things to us, sometimes without even asking. So as an example, on the Android phone, uh, if you have Google Now enabled, it will use your previous geolocations on your phone to tell you about the traffic conditions on particular routes, uh, the weather report at a particular place, and even appointments that you have coming up in the future. So I think this is really promising and fascinating that um, without requiring any overt work on the point of users, systems are becoming smart enough to use our location context to recommend information to us before we ask for it. Okay, fantastic. That's a great insight from you and in the uh, in terms of uh, where the technology is moving and uh, thank you so much for sharing your uh, uh, ideas and understanding. Thank you. Welcome to Poly Policy Pulse. My name is Kevin Pomfret, and I am the policy editor for GeoBiz and executive director of the Center for Spatial Law and Policy. Each show we will discuss the policy and legal issues associated with the collection, use, storage, distribution of geospatial information around the world. Today we're going to discuss some of the key policy issues that impact the commercial use of drones in the United States, and we are joined by Charles Mondello. Charles is president of the Property Drone Consortium, PDC, in this position, he leads the PDC in strategy and overall development for the use of unmanned aerial systems in property inspections. Previously, he was the chief industry strategist for the PDC, and he has been very active in the development of the consortium and overall Eagle View Protometry research concerning UAS and property inspections. Charles' career has included multiple leadership roles, including executive director, executive vice president of corporate development at Pictometry. He has had multiple positions in the other mm -hmm. geospatial commercial firms. Um, he, he's worked for the NRO, managing the development of large data collection and processing systems. He was selected to serve on the inaugural National Geospatial Advisory Committee. And Charles has a master's and a bachelor's degree in image science from the Rochester Institute of Technology. He is a certified as a geographic information systems professional, and he holds multiple patents in remote sensing and photogrammetry and oblique and real-time data processing. Charlie, thank you for joining us today. Your journey to become president of the Property Drone Consortium is a, is a really interesting one and, and in a lot of ways highlights the evolution of the geospatial community. C can you give us some background in terms of how you, how you got to where you are today? Sure, sure. Well, I hope you don't mind me being outside Hi, today. It's right here's some of the birds. Um, yeah, the stepping in from NRO and then working in multiple commercial venues, you can see the evolution of technology, um, you know, going from film-based data collection, uh, manned aircraft, um, myself and a couple others were one of the earliest digital aerial collect uh, 
redemption come uh, or re-energized uh, the oblique industry segments. And, you know, now as we continue to look forward, um, you know, it's a, it's a data fusion scenario more than anything else. You know, it's, it's space, air, and ground traditionally. Uh, uh, and, big, and now, you know, over this last handful of years, the, the drone segment is really getting a lot of, uh, a lot of attention. I think, and it's looked at as a uh, a new way to capture very high resolution content, complementing uh, manned aerial collection, which manned and space and ground aren't going to go away. I think this becomes a new. Charlie, you're breaking up on us a, a little bit. Um, can, can you hear us? Sure, no problem at all. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Property Drone Consortium? Sure. Uh, the PDC is um, an entity uh, that's been designed uh, with a series of insurance and roof. Thing and the Property Drone Consortium is to understand all that, uh, the materials, the construction that goes into it, uh, and be able to integrate um, all, all, sensor, all sensors, space, air, ground, uh, with drones. Uh, it's meant to um, develop the policy legislation and privacy um, and it's also meant to serve its members in terms of safety uh, we want to be ensured that the, the members who are doing this type of work are using drones and in a safe uh, and effective way um, so that's you know that's really the heart of the PDC um, you know we, we really want to be a, uh, a thermostat not a thermometer we want to be able to work with decision maker of software and hardware uh, and steer hopefully to the optimal safe solution for the members and for, for the next case. So can you hear me, Charlie? Yep, no problem, Kevin. Okay, you're 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 cutting in and out. Um, so I apologize if I, um, I mean, it, it sounds like you've got a you've got a a group of of companies together that are trying to deal with the the practical operational issues associated with the use of of UAVs in the insurance industry, but also understanding sort of the legal and policy issues as well, issues around safety issues correct. around uh, integration of the national airspace, issues around uh, privacy. Is that, is that true? Is that correct? All, all correct, Kevin. Okay. All correct. Um, and, I, and I believe also just trying to work with, with developing standards, both in terms of data format and transfer. Is that, is that correct as well? Yeah, we would, we would see that you know, this is a big data solution. Um, it's definitely the integration of different technologies across um, Again, the, the different methodologies by which they'd be captured. It's also vector raster uh, textual content. So it's it it's definitely most effectively used drones um, in in an optimized ROI for inspection construction. So definitely the case. Okay. Now I know um, I know you've recently received your uh, your, uh, your section 333 exemption from the from the mm -hmm. FAA for commercial use of, of UAVs as part of the PDC. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that process a little bit and, and what that receiving that exemption means to you? Sure, sure. So yeah, the the process is a good one. I mean, I know there's challenge.
cylinder spaces uh, in existence. So that, that's not a lightweight task. Um, so, you know, the, the process is lengthy. It's understanding the type of drone that you intend to use, how it's going to be integrated, the type of work you're going to use, submitting all the appropriate paper. He is doing multiples of those. Uh, that was just the first of what we hope of um, uh, 333 exemptions uh, for us. Um, again, it's not just the drone. Um, the key is it's a, it's a data fusion. So for us, the important piece is to be able to capture content, is to then take that content and build it into um, a better understanding of work from, because again anyone can pick up a drone and fly and you know we see a lot of people doing that you know even without the FAA's approval and that 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 is not good in general um, and even if they even if it's approved you know in, in many cases it's just about flying the drone uh, it's a sensor fusion between others, uh, and it's how all of that is going to play together when it comes to inspecting a structure, um, evaluating it, understanding the materials that it's made of, understanding then how to um, characterize data sets' the ability to quickly assess this particular target. So. So, so that what I what I appreciate about that, uh, Charlie, is that the concept that isn't it's more than just uh, operating the drone itself. It's more, all the, far more. Yeah, and, and that's a that's something that uh, right now we we're caught up in the in the here in the United States about all the policy issues associated with using being able to fly drones, but, mm -hmm. but it, it's it's as much all the other things that are going to come from that, and and the, the what the work PDC is trying to do is sort of get ahead of that curve. It sounds like. Correct. Absolutely correct. So um, can you explain, given there's a lot of issues around um, visual line of sight, nighttime flying, and, and, and sort of other requirements can, can, sure. that, are, that are imposed on your use of the, of the UAS, can you uh, maybe explain how you're trying to work with the government to, to address some of these issues and deal with these, uh, deal, deal with these issues and help, or help them to deal with these issues? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I mean, everyone has their fingers in, in UAS. And it seems they do because it's new, and they want to make sure they establish the, the correct policies going forward. Can't fault a soul for that. But what has to be taken into account you know, you know, for the, these types of, of industries, this is a very safe industry. Um, you know, the insurance carriers, the roof. terms of their skills, their knowledge, their safety protocols. I mean, these are, these are the people who, who absolutely work in and around safety um, and dealing with the public. So it's important that the different government agencies understand and really working toward the exact same down a drone with a, with a shirt that's being flown you know, irrespective of people's privacy. Um, this has to be an industry that is that is top notch, um, is doing everything it can to be upstanding. And the government agencies, state, local, and regional, and federal, all have to really come to the understanding that that's the case. Um, and again, they're, they're um, burdened with a huge amount of things coming at them right now, so I can't fault any tier of government. Um, but what's important is, you know, as you mentioned, PRM uh, and PDC did respond um, because there are things that will, will make actually the operation of UAS safer. Uh, and, you know, visual line of sight is an important one you brought up uh, for us to be able to inspect a property. Um, there are things that can be done to augment visual line of sight, like first-person view. 
we can have observers in the field. Um, system, many onboard GPS, so they understand roll, pitch, yaw, X, Y, Z, um, and you are controlling a board that's controlling the motors. Um, so they are, to some degree, uh, you know, they are absolutely fly by wire, um, and and to some degree autonomous. The home is autonomous flight. So we really do want to make sure that FAA and these other agencies are aware of the stipulations in and around um, the flying of drones and the technologies that benefit safety. Um, and can there are also technologies that can benefit privacy. So all the pieces by which the PDC uh, is going out now and talking to um, different tiers of government um, to try and work with them, absolutely understand their concerns, absolutely understand their limitations. Allow, trying to be an education hall right now. So Charlie, what I what I what I think I heard you say, and just for the benefit of those, um, when you when you cut out a little bit, is is that the in some ways the insurance industry is the, is the perfect uh, industry to sort of work on some of the safety and privacy issues because they have a long-standing need to be safe, to be to deal with the public, address some of these issues. They have a track record of of doing it and dealing with these issues. So this is a and and I guess the second part of this is that there are some operational and technical issues that you can do through the PDC that, that, that may show that, that, are, that are just as safe uh, or if not safer than some of the limitations that are be putting on operational use of the UAVs from a policy mm -hmm. standpoint. Is that, is that fair? Fair enough. Very fair, Kevin. Okay. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that you hear a lot about is, you know, what if a, a, if a drone or UAV were to crash, what would be the, the result of that? Um, I assume that insurance is an issue that, that you've needed to consider, not, not necessarily working with, just working with the insurance companies, but, but getting your own insurance as a, for the PDC for the, the drones that you're going to operate. Is that, is that fair? Is that true? Sure, sure. Yeah, and uh, it's new to some of the insurance uh, agencies uh, be able to capture content uh, is a new thing. Um, and for them to understand the risks associated with drone technologies is, is also new. Uh, they need to be able to do they what the drone will operate on um, the safety points that uh, need to be considered. Uh, um, around individuals. You know, the privacy matters, the structures we're flying in and around matter. So all of these things, okay. um, you know, may be new to individuals insuring these systems. It's not just insuring them, it's also insuring the entities um, that the drone is flying around. Uh, you know, this is, this is new. And I think we're seeing carriers step up to the plate, um, those that are interested in, in working this side of the equation. Well, that's great, and thank you. And, 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 and it does, my experience as well is that, that this is all new for the, for the insurance industry in terms of how to go about writing policies and what, sure. what the level should be. Um, some of the things that I've heard also is mm -hmm. that you, and maybe you said this and we got cut off, but is that uh, right now the insurance industry is requiring uh, that you get your an exemption, that you have an exemption before they're going to insure it for commercial purposes, which, which is a, in my mind sort of another sort of intersection of policy and, and law and operational considerations. Is that is that your mm -hmm. understanding as well? Very true. So you've touched upon this a little bit, um, but probably maybe we could talk about it a little bit more because it is sort of things that get talked about when you hear about UAVs is, is just the issue of privacy 
and um, you know some of the concerns that you see at the federal and expressed at the state level as well. Um, how is it impacting what what your what you want to do with with UAVs in the, at the PDC or just or just more broadly? Can you can you just discuss, discuss that a little bit? How it's going to impact you, how it's going to impact your operational aspects of of this? FAA has put out policy on the national airspace, um, as are the commercial enterprises. Um, so all of those uh, are requiring us to, again, you know, anyone can fly a drone. Uh, But when you're in service, it's very important that we understand, you know, how to portray what we're doing as, you know, uh, 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 to these decision policy makers. And as part of that, we have to provide them the technical understanding of what the drone can see, how the drone is pointing, uh, how the drone is maintaining um, coverage of a specific area so that it is not <clears throat> unregulated world. So as policymakers, you know, make informed decisions, we want to be part of that informed process by, you know, giving technical understanding, surveying users to really understand their their hot points, their key issues, um, to make sure that the, the drone is being operated safely and with respect to the, uh, the constituents of the insurance carrier want to check. They would like to be paid quickly. Um, so we, we need to find a methodology by which we can image what's needed and ensure that we respected others who were not part of that policy or that process. Um, when we're evaluating a structure, um, we want to make sure that we're imaging only that structure and other data has been removed and handled correctly. So all of those come into play uh, as we look at privacy. I, I like that response, Chai, because I, I think it highlights sort of the, the balancing between concerns over privacy and the benefits associated with the technology. And you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people getting paid more quickly if you can if you can get out there with a with a drone and and assess the situation and figure out what's what's wrong, and mm -hmm. um, or what damage has been done. And that's a, yeah, correct. That, right. That, that's a, that's a trade off that you're that you're you're looking to deal with on a, mm -hmm. on a day to day basis. I would imagine. Sure. Well, this has been really, uh, really interesting and, and helpful in sort of explaining, sort of, uh, you know, some of the considerations about commercial operations of drones in the U.S. and the potential policy and how they're impacting and what some of the key issues are. Given your vast experience in the geospatial community and the work that you're doing within uh, with the PDC, is there anything that we didn't ask? I didn't ask that you'd like to talk about and, and sort of let people know in terms of where you th see hmm. things are going from a a policy or, or even an operational standpoint? You really touched on the main ones, Kevin. To serve that the government, different tiers of government are trying to serve their constituents as are the members of the Property Drone Consortium. You know, we're, we're all after the same better good. Um, we're after the drone being used safely, um, correctly of individuals where after the ability for the drone to be integrated into the NAS in a safe way we want to see um, you know the, the, the public um, get a better understanding that when done that a drone can be used in a respectful way tiers of government and, and the commercial sector to try and specify these operations in in a way um, to you know each of each of the aspects of 
of user and policy maker. Uh, that's the role of the PDC. We're, we're not just about, we're, we're looking at how drones can be used, integrated, and, um, you know, in the most safe, safe, safe methodologies and respectful methodologies. So, no, all good questions you asked, and I think you covered all the key points, Kevin. Okay, well, I appreciate that. One thing that you, you highlighted and something that a, that a good friend who's a lawyer in a, in a large geospatial company who, who passed on to me several years ago, and I think it's reflected in your comments, is the solution to a lot of these issues is going to be a combination of uh, laws and policy, you know, business and technology, and understanding Perfect. all of them together. And it, uh, the PDC seems to be aware of that and working to sort of work with within the, the business technology and the policy communities to come up with, for a solution for UAV. So I, I commend you for that and the work that you're, you're doing. And I appreciate you taking the, the time for this informative discussion on the policy issues that impact the commercial use of drones in the U.S. Um, for those of you who are interested, there is a, there is a website that, uh, or a web page that you can visit uh, at the FAA. Um, and um, there it is at the, at the bottom of the screen. And that can sort of give you more information about the Section 333 exemption process for commercial use in the UAV, that, uh, or commercial use of UAVs in the United States. That's a, the process that the PDC has gone through. And I think last time I checked uh, yesterday, there's well over 600 uh, applicants that have been granted an exception by the FAA. So the process, and that's been since the end of 2014, and, and there are a large number that are being processed each day um, as the FAA gets ramped up to go through this. So for those of you who have any interest, uh, there, there's some information on that website. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us on, on Policy Pulse, and um, I look forward to talking to you again uh, next week. Thanks.